This video is intended to provide a brief introduction to the use of exceedance probability in disaster preparedness and disaster management. What I will do in this presentation is talk briefly about where the idea comes from and then discuss how that idea can be used in managing and preparing for natural disasters. That's the key to all of this. If we had any way of figuring out when, where, and how big a natural disaster would be, that would be just awesome. Remember, what we're trying to do is really predict the future. But we can get a notion of the probability of an event and how big that event is going to be. And we're going to use exceedance probability to help us do that. If we have a lot of good historical data, then it's really useful to use exceedance probability. There's two approaches that we can use to evaluate that data. The first is we use a simple equation to calculate an exceedance probability. The other is if we have enough data that we can calculate the probability of every single event, then we can create cumulative probabilities and create a much better measure of this exceedance probability using the cumulative. And I'll go over a couple of examples as well. The idea for all of this came about from a physicist named Per Bach, who with his graduate students, Tang and Weisenfeld, did a number of experiments on avalanches that occur. They were trying to find out how to generate computer models of landslides because they started this all off believing that they should be able to predict when a landslide would occur and how big the landslide would be. So they set up a simple experiment at the IBM Watson Research Lab where they poured sand onto a scale and they observed when that sand would fall off of the scale. So eventually the sand builds up and creates a nice cone which is called the angle at a specific angle determined by the angle of repose which has to do with the particle interactions. And as they add sand to the pile they imagine that landslides would occur. And the way they would measure the magnitude of those landslides was by measuring the drop in weight of the sand pile that's sitting on top of the scale. Well it turns out that they could not predict when a landslide was going to occur, and they also could not predict how big the landslide was going to be. And this led Bach to the notion of self-organized criticality, which in many ways a lot of people believe is a bit of a surrender to the complexity of the problem rather than coming up with a better closed-form solution to the problem. Nonetheless, the idea of exceedance probability stems from measuring things like landslides, avalanches, earthquakes, hurricane magnitudes, tornado magnitudes, flooding events, all of these things can be, exceedance probability can be applied to all of these things. What we need to do in order to calculate an exceedance probability is we have to have a number of observations of some event. I say here we have n observations of an event and then uh, we will calculate the exceedance probability by ranking all of those events from most consequential to least consequential and divide that by the total number of observations which should be a capital N, plus one. This gives us the exceedance probability. It's a really simple way of doing it. It comes from a ranked list of events, and that will become clear as we move forward. I reproduced a number of uh, box experiments where I, piled, I poured sand onto a scale, and I had scales with different size plates onto which I poured that sand. So I chose a four-inch diameter plate and a six-inch diameter plate. I dropped sand sand onto the plate which formed sand piles and then I measured the weight drop as avalanches occurred on those sand piles. Now it's pretty clear that the larger the plate upon which the sand falls, the larger the plate, the larger the maximum landslide could be. So this yellow curve represents the six inch diameter plate sequence uh, exceedance probabilities, and this red curve represents the four inch diameter plate exceedance probabilities. All we did is each one of these little triangles here represents a data point, which is a measured landslide magnitude. We took all of those landslides, so the magnitude of the landslide is measured as a weight drop from the platen, and we rank all of those and apply that simple formula right here to all of those things, this simple formula, and allows us to calculate this frequency or exceedance probability as a function of magnitude of the event or consequence. So you can think of this magnitude as magnitude of an earthquake, depth of flooding, magnitude of a sunspot event, many, many, many different things. For example, I went and gathered uh, data on how many millions of dollars were earned for various movies. I collected data over a number of years and I plotted 
I've ranked that data and plotted the exceedance as a function of gross receipts, and we get a really nice relationship. And this thing is called a power law. This is a power law relationship that relates the exceedance probability to the magnitude of the event raised to some power, and we use the exponent q to represent that curve. This graph shows the exceedance probability for power outages of a specific duration, that would be the consequence. The consequence in this case is the duration of a power outage. And the axis over here is the probability of an event of this size. Any Choose a number off of the x-axis, let's say six hours. What's the probability of having a six hour or greater power outage that is caused by the weather? This purple line is the weather-related exceedance probabilities. And the probability of six hours or greater is on the order of 30%. Now, a nuclear power plant would want to plan for such an event by having backup generators with a sufficient fuel supply to be able to accommodate long-duration power outages. You can see all the way out here, an entire day of having no off-site power is above 10%, maybe on the order of 15%. That's a pretty large probability event. And so you have to keep a lot of diesel on site to be able to run the backup generators and keep the power plant fully operational during that time. Well, all of these curves are power laws. And this is uh, an example of a set of curves of power laws where I have the exceedance probability plotted against the consequence. And I haven't defined what that consequence is. It could be lots of things. It could be the cost of an event. It could be number of deaths. It could be magnitude of an earthquake. It could be many different things. But what we're always doing is plotting consequence along the x-axis and exceedance probability along the y-axis. It always starts at one and then it drops off as we move out in consequence. Now I show here four different curves for different exponents in the power law relationship. I mentioned that the power law relationship is that the exceedance probability is related to one over the consequence raised to some exponent. So if the exponent is 0.1, we get this blue curve right here. What that blue curve says is that the probability as the magnitude of consequence increases, that's moving off to the right, the probability of that consequence is dropping. So what that means is low consequence events are very likely to occur. In fact, the lowest consequence event has 100% probability of occurring. And as we increase the magnitude of the consequences, the probability drops. But you'll notice that for this power of Q equal to 0.1, we still have at high consequence values, we have really high probabilities on the order of 60%. So if you had a power law, that looked like that, you would say, look, I have high consequence events that are very likely to occur. I got to do something to prevent that from happening. On the other hand, if your exponent Q gets large, I show Q being equal to Q, uh, two in yellow here, then what you'll note is that the probability drops off dramatically as the consequence increases. And so their probability of high consequence events is very low. If you are looking at natural disasters and you can show using historical data that the probability of high consequence events is very, very low, then you don't necessarily have to do anything to prevent those events from occurring. You can just respond to them. On the other hand, if the probability of a particular consequence is very high, as in this blue curve, you might want to do something to mitigate the damage that could occur or to prevent the damage that could occur and try to bring this curve down by implementing building codes, which is what we do in earthquake prone areas, or implementing uh, stilts for houses that are built in floodplains, or simply removing houses from the floodplains, all of which would be designed to prevent these large consequence events. So how do we do it? If a data set that we believe in and is reliable, we collect that data, we organize all of that data, then we organize the data from most to least consequential, and we apply a ranking to those things. I'll show you that in a minute. We calculate the probabilities of occurrence if we can. If we have enough data, we can calculate the probabilities of occurrence. And we calculate the cumulative probabilities if we can. Otherwise, we simply estimate the exceedance probability by taking the rank order and dividing that by the total number of data points plus one. 
That's a very simple way to calculate an exceedance probability. So this is an example. Cost of natural disasters from 1981. We take all of those disasters and we measure the magnitude. In this case, we're measuring the magnitude as losses associated with those natural disasters in billions of dollars. So this is the annual cost of natural disasters in the United States from 1981 all the way up to 2018. We rank the most consequential as rank one, second most consequential as rank two, and so on, all the way down to the bottom of the list. Now you'll notice that I have some duplication in here. I have several disasters that cost the same amount. You'll notice I have them there, I have them there, I have them there. So uh, the total number of different observations that I have in this case are 30. It's not the total count of observations, just the total number of different ones that I have. I take 30 plus one, I divide the rank by 31, and that gives me an exceedance probability. I calculate the exceedance probabilities for each of those ranked events, and then from that I can create occur. I get something that looks like this, where I plot the exceedance probability on the y-axis against the billion dollar consequence along the x-axis, and you'll notice that I get something that looks like a power law. So we can do a power law curve fit to that, and from that curve fit we would be able to extract the exponent from that data, which I will show in a short bit. So we have done this for lots of different materials. This is early work that we did, Rudy, Ted Lewis, and I did, where we were measuring the exceedance probabilities and fitting them with power laws for things like the volatility of the, of the S&P 500, large fires in cities, airline accidents, tornadoes, terrorisms, floods, all of that, and we extracted the power law exponents from each of those things. And you'll notice that when the exponent is greater than one, the power law falls off very quickly. And so these events are considered actually low risk. If the exponent than the power law is greater than one, then the power law falls off very quickly and you have low probabilities for high consequence events. Those are generally low risk events. If the exponent than the power law is now less than one, then it doesn't die off very quickly. I showed you that in the figure a few slides back. And so you need to do something about those. You need to implement protective measures. You need to implement regulatory fixes. You need to prepare for these things and not just respond to them because there is a high probability of high consequence events occurring. So let's just take a quick peek at the data on the cost of natural disasters in the United States, where we have listed the losses in billions of dollars, 1987 to 2018, and I have ranked all of those losses along with the date at which it occurred. Uh, the highest, most costly event was in 2017, $285 billion, in 2005, 224, 2012, 129, and so on. And then we calculate an exceedance probability for those by taking the rank number, and you'll notice that if they're the, if they're equal uh, cost, I rank them the same. And then what I do is I, in the exceedance probability column, I look at how many different ranks I have. I had 30, from 1 to 30. I take the rank number, that's this entry right here, and I divide it by 31. That gives me the exceedance probability here. I do that for each and every one of these entries, and I have a nice data table that I can then plot. Now that I have all of that data, I can go ahead and insert a plot. And so I'm going to go under the Insert tab up here, and I'm going to insert a scatter plot as shown here. And that uh, doesn't do much for me, but instead what I do is under the Design tab, I select my data, and I'm going to Add, and I'll go ahead and give it a series name. I'll call it, uh, and I have to pick my X values. Remember, along my X axis, I'm always going to choose the consequences, however you want to measure those things. So there's my consequences. That's good. Now I have to go back here and i got to choose my Y values. And for my Y values, I'm going to choose my exceedance probabilities. And I'm ready to plot. So there we go. I changed my Y axis by double clicking here. Change that to 1. 
And that's, uh, it's clearly some sort of power law. You can see that where we had natural disasters that didn't cost a lot, there's a lot more of those than the years where we had high cost natural disasters. And so this thing, again, it's not a perfect looking power law, but it behaves like a power law. We're going to go ahead and fit it with a power law by activating that plot window. And you'll notice that the chart tools tab opens up with design. I go over to the chart element on the upper left and I'm going to activate the trend line. And and none of that I want are there, so I'm going to go to more trend line options, which will pop up on the right side, and I'm going to click on the power law fit, and I'm going to go ahead and display that equation on the chart. So I now have the equation on the chart, I have a power law, and you can see that a power law fits this reasonably well and gives me an exponent of minus 0.8. And since this exponent is less than one, we have a problem on our hands. And that is we have fairly high probabilities of high consequence events. You can see that some really $225 billion events are just under 10% likelihood over the 30 some year time span of this data collection.